So as I was cleaning this, <clears throat> and this is why cheap crap from China is going to hurt you every time. So, yeah, that just, the handle just broke right off at the joint. And just from, you know, trying to clean the tip by rubbing it in the, um, in this thing, the, uh, the copper. So, I don't know. I cracked a bit of the ceramic there, right inside there. I don't know if that's going to make much of a difference, but, oh, yeah. Until the, uh, until the replacement tip comes, I might try and fix this thing, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I got my old standby. My good old standby, so I might just stick with that. Crap! Although I do just whinge about buying cheap crap from China. Had I not <clears throat> had to, um, plug this tip in, this pencil in, and have it not work, I would never have gotten to the point of taking this guy apart and reverse engineering the board. And uh, that's what we're going to do in this video. I'm going to try and do a little walkthrough of how this cheap clone of uh, Waco 936 actually works. It's um, fairly straightforward and I hope it will be interesting. Being the sucker for punishment that I am, 907 ESD safe, yeah, ESD safe. So, throwing good money after bad, I bought a replacement for it rather than buying myself a new soldering station. So, let's just pop this thing. You know what? What kind of a cable do we have on it to begin with? Uh, AWM 2464 VW-1, 80 degrees C, 300 volt, 24 wire gauge, Jihi! And what did we have on the other one? Did we have any distinguishing markings on it at all? No, there was no distinguishing markings on it whatsoever. So already we've at least got some measure of improvement. It has a bit of a softer feel to it. Let's, um, but this doesn't seem any better, that's for sure. So let's pop the, uh, the front off, heating element, and yeah, look at that. It's just like off on a, off on a kilter. This thing, well, it kind of slips over nicely. So at least this tip is somewhat fitted, but um, let's see if we can pull the heating element out of here and see what we've got as a replacement. Hmm. Got a spring much like on the other one. This should just slide out. The other one did. But maybe this one is actually built to a little tighter spec. Yeah, it does seem to be because it doesn't want to doesn't want to just pull out. What I was hoping to do was to be able to take a look at the uh, the pinouts relative to the relative to the to the uh, to the connector and make sure that it is a direct replacement. It looks like it should be. Now they look like they have similar. Um, uh, similar ceramic around the outside. This seems to have a bit smaller, the original has a bit smaller ceramic tip, it seems, but I don't have my, oh, I have these, which are just slightly better than having nothing. So let's take a look. This says 3.9-ish millimeters. And this says 3.8. So there's an extra millimeter of, or extra point, well, no, that says 3.8, and that says 3.9, and that says 3.9, and that says 3.9, and that, that says 3.8. So it thins down a bit at the tip, but it looks like I'm going to get a bit more um, connection between the ceramic element 
and the actual actual uh, solder tip, soldering tip. So let's pop this guy out of here if we can. Although, all oh right, what am I doing? I got the this part off, but not this part. There we go. Okay, so this is my my shovel tip. Ooh. So yeah, that feels like it fits a bit better. So I might get a bit better heat transfer, which would be nice. Um, that is at least still mounted in there on the the one that I had. This thing came out after a little while, so yeah, I might be I might I might be actually happy that I've got this now. So uh, so yeah, now. As far as the pinouts are concerned, I might just have to, um, I just might have to, uh, wing it, plug it in, see if it works, since this doesn't seem to want to be pushing out. Okay, so at least it's, looks like it's, um, heating up. Does it feel like it's heating up? I don't feel any heat coming off it yet. Yeah, heat's coming off it. Not a problem. So, looks like it might actually work. Oh, yeah. It doesn't go off. That's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem. It does not turn off. So... I have got to reverse engineer the pinouts of that relative to this, which means I'm going to have to actually get inside here and damn. So pin, pin one. So on my way to actually fixing this thing, I made some very silly blunders um, as I was um, doing the analysis. And I'll show you a few clips of, of that. So on the new handle, this guy's not shutting off. So what that means is the thermocouple in here is producing a different resistance relative to the temperature. Thermocouples don't have a resistance. They produce a voltage. Don't know what I was thinking. Okay, so those two pins there, um, the black and the uh, red wires coming out of <clears throat> the connector are going to those two points on the circuit board, the plus and the minus, um, which is the way they're labeled on the, um, on the, come on, get on there, which is the way they're labeled on the um, the module inside the uh, inside the wand, so plus and minus are the first two pairs. Now, those two wires, the blue and the white, were going to a thermocouple, which I think has failed in my original handle, as well as the um, the fact that the plastic broke, so it all. Um, went kaput at the same time. Anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to see how much um, voltage is being generated by the thermocouple and then we can use that. So quiescent it's producing about two point... well it's still cooling off but room temperature is around 2.7, 2.6 maybe. We'll see how far down it goes. Um, later on but when I turn the power on now current is flowing into the um, the heating element and you can see the temperature 
um, going up. Well, you can see the voltage is increasing as the temperature goes up. And then if I turn off the, um, the current flowing to the heating element, we can now see the, the voltage is going down. So the thermocouple that's in the wand there is producing a few millivolts per degree. Now, the original thermocouple was producing a different number of millivolts per degree, so I think that that's related to whether it's a K-type or an N-type thermocouple, so we'll just have to do some Googling and figure that out. Like, why, why wasn't I paying attention to that? Why didn't that... Why didn't that jump out at me? It was a negative voltage. The voltage was going up, not down. Okay, so here we've got a view of the inside of the soldering station. I am looking at the back of the circuit board. Those two pins there are coming from the, um, the secondary side of the transformer. So what we've got is one side going to this diode here, which is, I believe, D3 in my diagram. And then this is the resistor and the diode that are connected to the other side of the supply. So what this, um, these components are doing is it's producing a <clears throat> rectified, halfway rectified, together with a smoothing capacitor, which is this guy here, providing a rectified, um, see this capacitor goes across those two pins. So what we're going to get is we're going to get a somewhat rectified um, uh, half wave together with that um, that smoothing capacitor and we'll take a look at that on the oscilloscope in just a second. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to probe here and we will see what sort of a signal we get over on our oscilloscope. So the first signal we're going to take a look at is the uh, rectified signal. And so there we have the classic sawtooth style um, wave with the peak and then it falling off as the capacitor discharges. And um, if I take the DC component out, we just take a look at the AC signal, or the AC component of that, and that's just the peak and the ramp down as the capacitor discharges. So it charges the capacitor up, discharges the capacitor, the capacitor discharges into the circuit, so you get that sawtooth effect. Now if we look at the other side of that, um, of the return diode, um, we are going to see our full AC in. So that's um, 30 volts peak to peak. Okay, so here is our schematic of the, the power supply to the, uh, well, not all of this is power supply. Actually, only this part is power supply and that diode there. So in here, we've got our um, 120, uh, 120 volts AC. So that comes into the transformer. Out of this side of the transformer comes our approximately 30 volts AC. And it goes along here. It gets rectified by this diode. This um, resistor here is to drain the capacitor um, after power has been removed. And along here is the um, another diode that um, uh, basically chops off the, um, the negative half of the signal. So when I was looking at that first or the second waveform, I was looking on this side of this diode. And it's the second waveform was that 30 volts AC we saw, or we will see. I'm not sure which way I'm going to edit that. But when I take a look between this point and this point, what I, what I see is 30 volts. That's the typical, you know, the up, slow down, up, slow down, up, slow down. This is the discharge portion where the capacitor is discharging. And this is the, the peak that corresponds to our AC peak. So your input AC looks like this, if you're looking at that side of the circuit. And 
the smoothed, it goes up and then down, up and, and then down. And so that's the smoothed um, trace that you get. So that sort of razor thing. Um, you can look it up online. That'll show you how that works. But anyways, that's um, what we get. So that means that this point here it might as well call ground because it's at zero volts. So pin one of our op amp is the output of the one of the um, one of the two op amps in in this package, and what that is, as we saw in the schematic, or we will see on the schematic, is the um, output of the amplifier stage uh, for the thermocouple. Um, so the thermocouple comes in. There's some um, biasing that's done with these. Um, these diodes to bring um, the input voltage into um, a range that this um, op amp can can sense on, and then it um, adjusts the uh, the output voltage based on um, two things: what the input voltage is from the thermocouple, and then you can adjust that up and down using this trimmer pot. And I'll show you what um, that looks like on the oscilloscope. So now we're looking at the the waveform uh, measured at pin one, and what we're going to do is we're going to adjust our our trim pot, and we can see that the signal is very slightly moving up or down, depending on the value of the trim pot. Okay, so now what we're looking at is the um, signal at pin five of the um, the dual op amps and that's the second the inverting op uh, inverting input to the second um, portion second um, op amp in that dual op amp IC so now when you're turning the main pot which is the temperature set point potentiometer you can see that we're adjusting the voltage up and down quite obviously so what we need to do is we need to do the calculations on the resistances so that the set point temperature can be fine adjusted with the trimmer pot. Um, and, um, and we'll take a look at the, uh, the circuit diagram to see exactly how you might try and do that. Okay, what we're looking at here is the voltage at pin one uh, of our, of our uh, op amp. And remember, pin one was the output um, voltage as determined by our amplifier, first amplifier uh, in our op amp. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change the trim pot and we can see that that voltage changes a lot as we change that trim pot. It goes down to um, about 11.5, but if we take the trim pot up, we can get that up to about 13. So th the range of adjustability we have here is about 11 to about eventually okay so I figured out that the board is labeled thermocouple plus thermocouple minus um, however the new wand has the thermocouple either wired backwards inside of it I didn't check that or um, the yeah well it's wired backwards inside there because <clears throat> I had to swap these wires back and forth in order to um, in order to get this thing to chooch because I did not notice earlier that the voltage was going down as the thing was heating and it was going up as the thing was cooling but now when I turn it on at pin one we have a voltage that is increasing as the temperature yeah goes up so it gets up to 20 20 20.9 20 and remember we've got a target voltage that has to be somewhere in between 20 uh, what did I say 21.9 and 26 depending on what this pot is set at so you can see the the LED goes off now when I turn that down or turn it up let's let it get a little hotter and we'll see that eventually as the temperature or as the um, the voltage which is coming from uh, the first part first op amp in our in our in our dual op amp comes up you know 
keeps getting warmer and warmer and warmer till we get to you know probably 24 25 volts and then the LED will um, well wait let's try not to um, burn the house down maybe just just saying 24.2, 23, there we go. And now it starts to blink, and then it goes off. And then it goes on, and then it goes off. And then it goes on, and then it goes off. And then it goes, just like that. And that is now the new behavior of the wand. Now, I might need to do some adjusting of the values, I'll see how this thing works and we'll do some calibration, but man, oh man, the trick is paying attention all the time to what you're doing and not making assumptions that, that the wiring diagram and the color coding that people are using is actually the right color coding. Because in this case, it sure as hell isn't. Plus is not red and black is not minus. <sighs> Take a look at this schematic and see if we can't figure out what's going on here. We um, reviewed the power supply, rectified the voltage here. Now, what we have with these two op amps is interesting. So, first of all, we've got a Schmidt trigger right here. And so what that does is it produces a switch with hysteresis. So if you have a signal that's noisy coming in and you want to switch based on that noisy signal, but you want to have a threshold value, say here, so that the switch is open once you cross that threshold, but when you drop below that threshold, the switch closes until you come above that threshold again, and then the switch opens. You um, use what's called a Schmidt trigger. So notice here, let's expand on this section here. That might look something wild like this. And say you want to trigger here. And so this is where it triggers first. But it drops down here, but it goes back up. So you want to give some sort of a, um, a I guess, um, a relaxation in your switching regimen so that you don't always switch every time it makes a cross. But you switch it up, you assume that the signal is noisy, and then eventually it'll come down, and the same story happens over here. The first time it crosses, it's fine. And then, so this will go down to zero here, and this will go high here. So it goes up high, and then goes down to zero. And notice that there could be many crossings in a short period of time. And the, what a hysteresis loop looks like is it looks sort of like this. So you've got a state diagram, and it goes along like this. It goes up. It might come down or it might stay. So it stays on, but there's this gap here that uh, it stays on um, despite fluctuations in this range, and that's what call, you call hysteresis. So switching for noisy signals is one thing that you use a uh, Schmidt trigger for. Another thing you use a Schmidt trigger for is to um, produce a duty cycle based on a fluctuating a, fluctu a noisy fluctuating signal. For example, if this represents the temperature of the thermocouple, it's going to be winding its way up. If we can turn the, um, the heating element off, this will start to fall. But we don't want to switch it back and forth really quickly as the temperature falls. We want to let it descend a bit before turning it back on. And until it rises past here. So we want this sort of null band of 
turn the um, heating element off, let it fall for a little bit, turn the heating ele element back on until it gets back up here, and then turn the heating element back off. And so we'll have this signal that looks like this, and we want this null band, which will be um, sort of define a, a, a PWM uh, pulse width modulation of our heating element based on this um, gap in this Schmidt trigger. Sorry, this gap in the Schmidt trigger. So that's how this thing is working. The other part of the op amp is just basically an amplifier that is amplifying the, um, the signal coming from the thermocouple. So we have this set point, 21, which is adjustable based on the um, potentiometer that's on the front of the panel. And uh, this, this pot will adjust the reference voltage here to between 21.5, or sorry, 21.9 to 26.3 volts. And so what we want to do is we want to have our incoming voltage somewhere um, in that range depending on what the t actual temperature is of the of the thermocouple. Now we've got this little trimmer pot here that can adjust the gain on this op amp. So we will have a signal coming from the thermocouple that is trimmable using this pot and this signal will um, range up to about you know 26 volts and then um, it will um, fall as the uh, as the voltage falls. So what this op amp is doing is it's taking this small difference in voltage between these two these two pins and amplifying that into the signal that we're going to use to drive <clears throat> this Schmidt trigger. We've got our reference voltage that's set here. This is the output of the op amp from pin one, and this is the what trims the value up the value of this up and down relative to the actual thermocouple temperature. And so that's how we calibrate our, our device. So that is basically the operating principle of this thing. And, um, oh man, if only I had noticed this sooner. Holy smokes, it would have saved me so much time.